So again, we're, we're going to give you the full question so you know what it is. And then these men get 20 minutes for their answer. At the 18-minute mark, they're going to hear this sound. Now you say, you are going to ding a preacher? We look forward to it all week long. <laughs> but you understand, they get 20 minutes. We have six questions. That's two hours. If they each take 25 minutes, that's two and a half hours. The hamburgers will be rock hard. The kitchen crew will fire me. And so we have to stick with this time limit. So at 18 minutes again, they hear this sound. That means, gentlemen, you have two minutes left. At the 20 minute mark, you'll hear this sound. And that means you are done. We will let you finish that sentence that you're in. And you say, this is crazy. This is how we run our young preachers. When they preach here, they get, they get eight minutes. And they all complain that's not enough time. So these men will say, 20 minutes isn't enough time. Now, you don't have to take 20 minutes. If you're done in 15, that's fine. Very first question, and their time starts when they get up here. Uh, very first question is, Brother really Kyriopoulos, should a church be involved in politics? So write that word in there. Should a church be involved in politics? If so, how? And so Brother Kyriopoulos, if you'd come. Now, could I say this? You're going to get upset somewhere with one of these questions. Be mature, throw it over your shoulder, so the person behind you will choke and leave the church, but you won't. <laughs> uh, I'm saying, I say this when our young preachers preach, you are going to hear something said that God has never heard before. Don't get rattled with that. Throw it over your shoulder if it doesn't fit, if the shoe's not the right size. Look to get a blessing. You ready? Amen. All right. So should a church be involved in politics? And if so, how much? Well, um, I know that for the longest time, we uh, always uh, tend to, to ignore political issues because we always felt that um, we live here in Canada where it's a free country and uh, things like um, political divides or issues or um, persecutions happen in other parts of the world. And so we never really felt too, um, too much inclined to have to be involved or, or even study or to be even aware of what's going on in the political arena of our country. But uh, I think in the last couple of years, that has changed. Our mindset has changed a little bit, and it probably behooves us to know a little bit more of what's going on politically and how should we be involved, should a church be involved. Um, I, I think the answer to this is pretty balanced. And uh, I want to start with uh, Romans chapter 13. So if you could please turn to Romans chapter 13. And um, one of the things that I do, okay, I, I, uh, I don't know, maybe it's because of my, my Greek background, you know, or something. I don't know what it is, but we just kind of, we tend to talk a lot about politics. And... Um, Sometimes it does come out a little bit into the preaching, but really what it comes out more into is knowing what politicians are doing and whether it's right or wrong. Now, uh, you know, you could say, well, you're being too political. Well, I, I kind of wrestled with that a little bit once. And uh, the Lord uh, spoke to my heart about something and it has to do with the old time prophets. Now, I understand we are not Israel, but the prophets of the Old Testament all preached on the issues of their day. And um, a lot of those issues were social issues and political issues. And they did preach against the sins of even the kings and the rulers. They did point those sins out. And I do believe that it's a church's job to preach against sin and to even mention, even when, like let's say things, issues like abortion, gay marriage, whatever, and to, not necessarily to be telling the government what to do or to try to run the government, but to say this is wrong. And I think it's good for us to do that. Now, what happens is that people say, well, we should not be political. We are Baptists and we believe in separation of church and state. Now, you know what separation of church and state is? Separation of church and state simply says that the church, there's no church-state setup that there's no official religion. 
Okay, you understand? No official religion that can be enforced on the people. That's separation of church and state. So the government, you know, they govern, they take care of, you know, they, they uh, you know, they take care of uh, uh, all the issues like, you know, I mean, whether you're supposed to, you know, stop at stop signs or whatever, you know, these are the laws, these are the bylaws. But when it comes to religious matters, they are not to impose religious things onto a population. How to worship. What to, you know, what church is, a, is the one that people should be, um, you know, should be in. That, that's separation of church and state. So, I mean, what, when, we, when we go into separation of church and state, people begin to say, well, you should not say anything or be involved at all in anything pol political. But uh, separation of church and state does not mean separation of God and state. There's a difference. I believe that our rulers should, be, should fear God. I'm not saying that they have to be Baptist or anything like that. Of course, if they'd be Baptist, that'd be great, wonderful, <laughs> amen. But, but, uh, but separation of church and state does not mean separation of God and state. And, and um, we, we, we uh, as a church, we have reached out to our politicians in our area. The liberal politicians, the, uh, we don't have any conservative politicians in our area. They're all liberals. And I have gone to, um, to three uh, or four different uh, offices and sat down with the members of parliament and witnessed to them, given them Bibles, and prayed with them and for them. And they'll tell me, can you pray for my children? They are, so, you know, sometimes they'll even tell me, you know, uh, I have a child, you know, who's struggling with this, with this, or whatever. And we'll, we'll sit there in their office and we'll pray for them and give them the gospel. And give them a Bible. And they have, one guy actually, we, we went there and we told them what Baptists believe. And we gave, we have a big postcard, a picture we took of our church with a, you know, you know, vast majority of the congregation, not all of it. And you could see in, in that postcard, you know, you could see all the different cultures, you know, and all the different colors of skin that everybody together smiling and under a big title, you know, Bible Baptist Church. And we are your constituents. And here we give it to them. And they look at it and they go, wow, you know, that's interesting. And what they're thinking is votes. Right? They're thinking votes. So, I mean, they are going to take us, but we go there because obviously the media is going to paint Baptists, you know, as, as a mean group. You know, most of the group that, that gets most of the media attention is like Westboro Baptist Church. You know, these, these fanatics or whatever, these people that are, uh, you, know, you know, they do crazy stuff. But when you go there and you, uh, and you present yourself and you tell your politicians who you are and what you believe... You know, uh, we give them a Bible, and then at the end they'll say, can we take a picture together? And uh, his name was Frank Bayless. I don't know if you know who Frank Bayless is. He's a member of Parliament of the Liberal Party. And we gave him a Bible, and he said, let's take a picture together. And he held his Bible like this. And I had me and Brother George Antonio, you know, on either side of him. And we took a picture together, and he put it all over his social media. And we went to see another person, another member of Parliament, and... Um, uh, she's, uh, she was Catholic, of course, you know, a, a member of parliament with the Liberal Party. And um, before we got there, her assistant was in the office, and her assistant said this. Her assistant said, looked at us and said, they're Lebanese. And she looked at us and she said, you know we're in trouble. And we said, what do you mean? And, and she said, she looked around, you know, the office door was open, and she was kind of like looking around. She's like, well, we won't talk here too much. And she sat behind her desk and she pulled out the, a local newspaper that had on the cover the picture of Canada's latest stamp. And we're talking now, this was about 2000, this was before COVID, the, the Canada's latest stamp, and it was a big picture of Ramadan. And she looked at it and she said, this is what's coming. Now we're talking about Member of Parliament, Liberal Party of Canada, Trudeau's people. And she threw that in the trash. She said, Pfft. She was disgusted and threw it in the trash. She said, when so-and-so is here, the, you know, the member of parliament, because this was, this was her assistant, talk to her. She said, talk to her. I said, we're going to try. She said, please talk to her. Now, she wasn't there that day, so we did not get to talk to her, but we witnessed to everybody there. We gave them all the gospel. We gave them all Bibles. 
I got a phone call a few months later from the same lady. She said, I booked you an appointment to talk to her. She's going to be available. So I went alone and I brought a Bible and I talked to her about abortion. I talked to her about, you know, you're from Lebanon. I said, why, is, why are you bringing back ISIS fighters? Do you think ISIS is a terrorist organization? Pastor, of course, why do you ask me these questions? You know, like, well, why are you bringing them back without even being vetted? You know, I'm, and then I said, you, you could tell she was just shoving me away. I said, can we take a picture to get, no. I said, actually, can I give you something? I gave her a Bible. She said, thank you very much, thank you very much. Now, her daughter is a Baptist and has visited our church, okay? Her daughter's a Baptist that has visited our church. So she said, so she, she took the Bible. She said, yes, I went to my daughter's baptism. I saw her get baptized. She said, I'm not a Baptist, I'm Maronite, very hardcore strand of Roman Catholic. But um, at the end of our interview together, her assistant took a picture of us. But this time, I searched her social media. And this time, when we had the picture together with me handing her the Bible, that part was cut out. She took the Bible out. Now, the other guy, Frank Bayliss, I mean, he's, you know, he's, you know, he's, these, these politicians are on the wrong side of every issue. You know, but that guy put the Bible in his picture. She didn't. You know, and you know what happened to her a little while later? She lost her job. Trudeau fired her. <laughs> she was what they call red letter. Do you know why? Because of something, a position she took that was on the right side of an issue, biblically speaking, because of course she's very Catholic and very, th those people are very against abortion. But uh, because of that, she was replaced by somebody else. Her daughter came to our church and we had a private conversation and she was giving me some details of what was going on. She said, she said, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. So should we be involved in politics? Is there a separation of church and state? Yes, but there's not a separation of God and state. There's not a separation of God and state. We, are, I believe, are required to remind the government that they are under God. Now let's go to Romans chapter 13. Verse 1 says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist the, uh, shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil wilt thou then be, not be afraid of the power. Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now people have read those four verses a lot in the last little uh, while when it comes to, you know, uh, the lockdowns and should we shut our churches when the government tells us to close our churches and all that stuff. Uh, uh, and so, you know, they, they throw this chapter at you and say, you're supposed to obey the government when the government says close your church, when the government says shut down, when the government says wear a mask, when the government says do this or that, you're supposed to obey the government. And so they, they give you this chapter to prove that whatever they say, you should obey. But what do you do when your government is North Korea? What do you do when your government is China? Uh, my, my good friend, of course you know him, Brother Luigi and Miss Sabrina, his wife, they were missionaries 18 years in China. He had to leave China because they broke into his, they never knew, every time they got together in church, they never knew if that was going to be the last time they ever got together. Because the police could bust in and arrest them anytime. And the police had the legal right there to do that. And so they didn't know if every time they got together, is this going to be our last time? Well, one day it finally was. The police came in, walked right up to the pulpit, looked at him and said, you stop right now. He said, okay. They took them, they arrested him, they put him down in a prison somewhere. Uh, they put him in a chair that you lock the ankles and the wrists. They didn't lock him, but they did put him in that chair for questioning. They took his fingerprints. They took a sample of his blood. Somebody punched him in the back of the head. They took all these things uh, in, in a file. And you say, that's China. Yeah, but, you know, China was not always like that. China was not always like that. There, do you know the history of China? The previous leader of China before Mao Zedong, you know who it was? Chiang Kai-shek. He was married to a missionary's daughter. They were, they were free. And now they're not. 
This is what I want you to understand. They have banned Christian. Not they. You know what they do in China? They don't. They don't necessarily ban Christian Christianity. They they have Christian churches, but they are led by their people. And in the, at the top, they have to have a picture of the communist Chinese leader next to the cross as one of the. And I'm running out of time here, but I'm trying to say this. They will not ban Christianity, but they will ban things Christians do. And that Bible says they're, they're not a terror to good works, but they, they punish evil, not good. Now, is going to church good or evil? It's good. So they, it's not their job to punish somebody for doing good. It's their job to punish somebody for doing evil. And when you do something evil and you get punished, yet then yes, they are doing their job. But when they start deciding what's good and evil, now they have assumed the place of God. And they are not above God. Now the Bible says this. Go with me to Matthew chapter 5 real quick. Matthew chapter 5. Of course the example of Daniel has already been given. Okay. When he, was, he got punished for doing something good. You know, you, you know uh, this man Arthur Pawlowski. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how you say his last name, but I, I love that clip where they come in and he's like, get out, you Nazi! <laughs> Gestapo! It's, it's unbelievable! Sick people! <laughs> Gestapo! Get out! <laughs> I love that clip, you know, but you know, I, I, I'm serious, like, they, they came into our church too. I didn't react that way, but I, I, and a lot of people have criticized him for being the way he is, but you know what? His victory is now our victory because that sets a precedent for all churches. Right. You can't arrest somebody for having church. And you know something? You, you, this is what people are saying. You're doing something illegal. No. They're doing something illegal. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Who has actually read the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms? I'm not going to, I mean all of it. Do we know, did you know that Paul the Apostle used his Roman citizenship to his advantage? Right. When they arrested him? He said, is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? And they said, don't do anything to him. He's a Roman. He has rights. And he said, I was free born. I was born with the rights of a Roman citizen on me. Because, you know, if you're born in this country, you're born with rights granted to you from birth. And why those people took that stand, like James Coates or Arthur Pawlowski and several others across this country, I mean, we did too, and we didn't get the media attention because we didn't look for it. But at the same time, I mean, we, is because I, I had no guilty conscience about it because I knew that what they were doing was illegal according to our laws. I wasn't doing anything illegal. They were doing something illegal. Now, Matthew chapter 5 says this, verse 10. This is what a lot of people have said. They've never stopped us from preaching the gospel. But it's not just about the gospel. Look what it says in Matthew 5, 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for what? Righteousness sake. It's not just the gospel, it's righteousness. And those men, like James Coates or... Arthur Pawlowski, they were doing something right. And they were forbidden from doing something right. Here's another example in the Bible. The Egyptian midwives. Remember that? They were told to do what? Kill all the children, uh, the male children when they're born. And the Bible says they feared God and disobeyed Pharaoh. And you know what? God blessed them for that. God bless them for that. Another man who came to our, um, to our church, Pierre Poiliev, we had him come to our church. Leo Husakos, a senator. I've made friendships with these people. Uh, I had Pierre Poiliev stand up in front of everybody. He gave a speech, and then I asked him several questions. I asked him what he thinks about abortion. I asked him what he thinks about Israel. I asked him what he thinks about the, the mandates. I asked him what he thinks about the fire and the gun ban. And, you know, I mean, he's not exactly where we would all be 100%. But my last question to him was, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died on the cross and he rose again from the grave the third day? And he said, yes, I do. I'm not saying the man's saved. But this is what I believe about voting. Unless the Lord Jesus Christ is on the ballot, 
Everybody else on that ballot is a sinner. So you're only going to vote for the best option. And what we should always be looking for is freedom and Israel. Those are two very important issues to me. Freedom and Israel. Um, I'll give you another thing. Now, um, let's go to the book of Acts. And I have one minute left. The book of Acts. Okay, two minutes. Okay, the book of Acts. And I believe it's... Uh, where is that? Acts chapter... Because I want to talk a little bit about this thing about the uh, um, conspiracies. Government conspiracies. Okay? Uh, Brother Newman was talking about the other day, you know, when you have, everybody has that in their church to have that loose cannon, you know? And I'm thinking, one loose cannon? Man, I got several. <laughs> you know? They're on my case all the time. But, you know, we are told to pray for people in authority. You know why? Because it's effective. It's effective. If God tells us to do it, then yes, it definitely is effective. The reason why the United States has the Bill of Rights is because of John Lennon, a Baptist preacher who, was, who met with James Madison, and James Madison wanted the Constitution to be ratified in the South. John Lennon was the, main, was the leader of the Baptists. He said, I'll only do it if you guarantee freedom of religion. He said, let's shake on it. You know, and he said, um, he said, I'll give you a Bill of Rights. And uh, the reason why that Bill of Rights came, which guarantees freedom of religion, is because of a Baptist preacher named John Leland. I I'm trying to say it real quick because I'm running out of time, but that's true. That's true history. Now, the word conspiracy is in the Bible in Acts 23, verse 13. There is a conspiracy in the Bible, you know what? To have Paul killed. So do conspiracies exist? Yes. Yes, but they got together and made a conspiracy to kill Paul. But you know what? If you notice there in verse 11, God promised him that he was going to be okay, which means this. Even if man and politicians have some kind of global conspiracy that they are cooking up behind the scenes, God is ultimately in control and their conspiracy will fail. It will fail. You do not have to fear government conspiracies because God is above the government. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's it. That's all you get. Oh, before you leave, I want to present, <laughs> I want to present Brother Kyriopoulos that I offended so deeply. I mean, before he went, he, he's staying at our house. We haven't given him the nicest bed. But uh, before he went to bed last night, he moaned and groaned. And I don't want to say bellyache. I don't want to say complain. I don't want to say critical. I don't want to say that, though those words do come to mind, about the fact that he felt that he deserved this pen. And so, brother, I don't know how to apologize. <laughs> Isn't it good to have friends? I wish I had one of them here today. <laughs> Question number two, is reading books important? And if so, are there any books that you have found especially helpful? Now, you might think this is just a plain question that wouldn't, wouldn't... Almost every time I'm with Brother Newman, he said, Pastor Carlson, I don't know if you've ever read this book, but this book... And he mentions a book here, a book there. And so at very least, write some of these titles down. They have had a profound effect on him. Brother, would you come? All right, real quick, look at 2 Timothy 4, just for a second. Second Timothy four, and look at verse thirteen. Second Timothy four, verse thirteen. Second Timothy four, verse thirteen says, "The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments." Of course, the parchments would be the scriptures. So you know, um, um, uh, books are uh, important, and books are. Very helpful. A um, number of years ago, I heard Alan Jones say this. 
he said, the problem with a lot of pastors is they don't study. They don't study. Um, uh, John Wesley wrote um, to one of his preacher boys that he hadn't seen in a long time. And uh, years had lapsed, and he heard him preach. And he wrote this letter, and this letter actually is well known. You can still get a hold of it. And, and John Wesley writes a, a letter. It's just two or three paragraphs to this guy. And his name was John Trembleth. And he said to John, he said, Your preaching is lively, but not deep. He said, It is the same as it was years ago. He said, Nothing can make up for the deficiency in your preaching except for reading. I got a hold of a book called The Digital Invasion. And it was recommended to me. And it's written by two um, two. Uh, PhDs in psychology and psychiatry and all that. And, um, and, and they're just talking about the effect of how the computer world has come in and invaded our society. And um, so in the course of the book, there's all sorts of things that come up. Um, you know, what a lot of people do today is they have really replaced a lot of reading with their computer. And, um, and in their mind, they think there's no difference. Now, I don't know what the scientific difference is, and, and more information is coming out about this as time goes along. But, um, but several schools uh, began to arise in the U.S., uh, and they were experimental. You know, um, the schools of today, you know, um, like we've got a school, a rural school, about an hour from us, and they were one of the first... Um, pilot schools uh, to use computers for everything and every subject, and they went totally digital. And of course, you know, everybody thinks, well, you know, that's the wave of the future, and that's a marvelous thing. Well, they, um, they did this thing in the States in a in few places, and, and at the writing of the book, about 20 of these schools had popped up, where they uh, brought the kids in, and uh, of course, they were private schools, and they took away their phones, and there were no computers, and they gave them a pen and paper. Now, they would one hour a day, you know, give them a computer class, because obviously you have to know how to function with that. But when they went to pen and paper and they tested them, the test scores started skyrocketing. They said there is something about the way your brain processes information. Um, and believe it or not, pen and paper and real books are still superior. Um, you know, this is the day of multitasking, and, and people really pride themselves on doing many things at once. And one of the guys that wrote this book, you know, there again, he's a PhD in, you know, his field of psychology or whatever it is, and uh, something in that field. And he said um, two things. He said, I had a class of Ph.D. students, and he said, I was teaching them, and, and he said, they, they prided themselves on being able to do several things at once, you know, and, and, and especially on the computer. And he said, um, I wanted to show them that their performance was dropping. And he said, so I had one group, uh, I allowed them to do their study in a certain area, that just the same old way they always did it, and I had another group that stayed very focused. And he said... Um, he said, and what happened, of course, the group that stayed focused, he said, they, uh, their performance began to increase. He said, the group that was multitasking, he said, their performance was nosediving. Now, these are Ph.D. students. These are, these are bright guys. And he said, when I showed them that their performance was dropping, he said, they got angry with me because they didn't agree. But to an outsider, it was obvious. There's a, there's a school... Um, in the U.S. where they train elite fighter pilots. They call that a top gun school. And um, so when they, when they bring in uh, a potential candidate for this top gun fighter pilot school, this is one of the questions they ask. Are you a good multitasker? Now, what do you think the right answer should be? If they say, oh, yes, they are instantly disqualified. We see, we think that's a great thing, <laughs> but it's not. Now, we have to multitask, you know, we, we have to do that to some degree. But, you know, they don't want a guy flying a multi-million dollar fighter jet 
with his mind in three different places. They want him to think sequentially and focus. Um, you know, when, when you read, when you read, you know, if you open a book, you know, three different screens don't pop up. You're focused. You're focused. Um, people say, um, you know, it's hard to find time to read. And, um, you know, and I, I know we're, we're all busy and it is crazy. Um, and yet I think of my dad. My dad got saved and, uh, when he was 40. And um, for some reason, the preacher put him in charge of the church library that the church was starting. And my dad worked a lot of long hours, a lot of swing shifts. Uh, I mean, my dad worked 12-hour shifts and a lot of times 16-hour shifts, a lot of them. And I remember seeing my dad in the bedroom, and uh, he'd be laying across the bed, and there'd be one of those books from the church, and he'd be spread out the floor, and dad was on the edge of the bed, and he's, he's reading, reading, reading. And, and he didn't neglect us to do it. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, you can take anything to an extreme, uh, you know. But, you know, um, um, books, books. Um, I thought I had my phone here. I don't, I, I, not, not your phone, but a book. Um, you know, and, and you got people and they do this thing where they look things up on Google all the time. And, and I do that too sometimes. But the problem you've got to remember with Google and Wikipedia and these things is they are purposely limiting and controlling the flow of information so that many times I've looked for something and couldn't find it on the Internet because it was removed. You know, say, well, well, I looked it up on Google and I looked up on Wikipedia. Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying you can't do that. But the problem is, just remember, you're not probably... Going to get the full picture. You know where you're going to find it? In a book somewhere. Um, you say, I'm not a reader. Okay, can I encourage you? Really, can I encourage you? Work at it. Cultivate it. I had a friend in Bible school, and um, he was uh, an inspiration to me, and he was one of these guys. Uh, we, we were all, in Bible school, we were all, all the girls... And the girls' dormitory were making a lot of money off of us because they were charging 50 cents a page to type up our notebooks for us. I mean, we, I mean, we, we, we hand wrote them. We hand wrote them because you had to take notes. But the professor didn't want to see our handwritten notes because he couldn't read our writing. So, you know, the, the rule was at the end of the semester, you had to pass all the tests. But you also had to hand in your notebooks. And, um, and my buddy across the hall, who was instrumental in my salvation, he... Um, he uh, you know, this, this was Kevin. This was Kevin. He thought, well, I'm not going to spend that money. He goes to the library, gets an ancient book on typing, a book, and he's sitting there. And I mean, at the end of the week, he was typing 20 words a minute. And then he typed his own notebooks. Um, you know, you can cultivate some things. You know, we've got to push ourselves a little bit. And it's, listen to me, so many of these things, you know, we, we encourage people to do things and, and they get overwhelmed. And the devil, the devil always paints this monstrous picture in your mind of, of all this. But, you know, baby steps, baby steps. You know, I, I got a book at home. It's called The Fly Lady. Some of you are familiar with, some of you ladies are familiar with that book. And it's this lady whose house was a disaster and her, her world was falling apart. And, and she developed this system to sort of bring her world under control and to start cleaning her house. And um, one of her things was she would set a timer for 15 minutes and she would tackle some job for at least 15 minutes. She said, you know, you can do anything for 15 minutes. You know, you could read a book for 15 minutes. You could, and I'm not saying, you read your Bible first, obviously that comes first. You know, you underestimate yourself. You really do. Paul said, um, but I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. You know, some of you guys, the biggest problem you have is you're not used to ever making yourself do something. And it is, it is a great day. It will be a red letter day in your life when you will start 
making yourself do some things. And you say, well, preacher, you know, I'm, I'm not real educated and I didn't do real well in school and all that. You know, I've, several years ago, I heard Alan Jones recommend a book. And I, I don't necessarily recommend this book. I'm going to give you some names of some books. But, but he gave me a, he, he recommended this book called The Closing of the American Mind by Alan Bloom. And uh, he said, you got to read it. He said, he's a university professor. And he says, he talks, he's lost, he's a heathen. And he talks about what he saw in 30 years of being a university professor and all the changes that he saw that have brought us to the crazy place where we are now. And uh, so I got the book, you know, I found it at the thrift store, started reading it. And man, that guy, yes, he's a college professor and he writes like a college professor. And you know what I had to do? I literally had to get a dictionary and and about three times on every page, I was looking up a word, and I would pencil in a few pieces of the definition in the column so that I could understand what he was, re what he was writing. But I wanted to know. I could have just put it away, and the book was so amazing and so revealing. But, you know, it, it just took a little effort, you know. I just had to get the dictionary and just look up a few words. Is that so hard to do? Let me give you some books that have really helped me in my life. Really, really helped me. There's a, there's a book, and some of these are still available, and some of them you'll, you'll, you can find. You know you can find them online, or you might, really, you can, you can look up. You can find a lot of these online unused books. But when I was in Bible college, when I was 18, I came across a book that was on the bookshelf called Practical Religion. By J. C. Ryle, R. Y. L. E. And the first chapter of that book was on examining yourself about salvation. And that book led me to Jesus Christ. He wrote that book in 1878. And over a hundred years later, he's still having people saved because of what he wrote. That book, it's, it's just about what the title says. It's, it's a bunch of random subjects about the Christian life, but it's all extremely practical. And um, that book was amazing. It helped me, and it's helped me since. But J.C. Ryle, I'm going to give you three or four books by him that if you can get hold of them, and they are still available. Another one is called Holiness. By J.C. Ryle. Holiness. An amazing, amazing book. Some of these guys that wrote in the, um, you know, you go back, you know, in the 16, 17, 1800. Some of those guys were hard to read because of their English. J.C. Ryle is very easy to read. Very easy to read. Very understandable. Believe it or not, he was a bishop in the Church of England. But he was one of those people in the Church of England that knew God and loved God. And if he lived today... He would probably be one of us. Um, another book he wrote. Uh, my wife came across this in a thrift store. Um, it's called The Wheat and the Chaff. The Wheat and the Chaff. And in that book, he has a chapter called Watch. W-A-T-C-H. The name of the book is The Wheat and the Chaff. That's really the, 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 the thing you need to remember. And in that, in that book, now remember he's writing this in the late 1800s. He's writing about the Lord's return. And he was pre-trib and pre-millennial long before it was, you know, uh, a common thing. And he had come to those conclusions by reading the Bible himself. And even in his own day, many people in his own ranks did not believe in the pre-trib rapture or the pre-millennial coming of Jesus Christ. They spiritualized everything. And um, J.C. Ryle, he had the right spin on Israel. Now remember, Israel didn't become a nation until 1948. But in the late 1870s, I'm reading this. And one of the things you see there is there's no new thing under the sun. And God's truth has always been God's truth. And, 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 and long before there were all these debates about all that stuff, it, 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 and he... It's unbelievable. I just copied it for one of our guys who's here. I'm copying it for one of our ladies. Um, another book he wrote called Christian Leaders of the 18th Century. That book is amazing. How many, all of you, we all love stories. He writes about the guys that turned the tide 
in the 1700s. It's called Christian Leaders of the 18th Century. He writes about Whitfield. He writes about John Wesley. And then he writes about four or five guys that, that lived in England that none of us have ever heard of, for the most part. You know what I find? The books I'm recommending to you, these are books that I revisit. There's some books I've read, and they were amazing, and they were good information. And I go, well, that was a good book, you know, and, and I sort of make a note of it. But I'll never read it again. But I got about 20 or 25 books that if I got stuck on a desert island, I would want those. They have helped me, and every once in a while, I revisit them. They stir me. They inspire me. They just help me. I'll give you another one, and this is an excellent book. It's called Duncan Campbell, an Autobiography. It actually um, is under another title now. But if you look up Duncan Campbell, an Autobiography, and the author is significant. You need to know his name because there's more than one Duncan Campbell. The author's name is Andrew... Woolsey, W-O-O-L, like wool, S-E-Y. And he writes about Duncan Campbell. Duncan Campbell was instrumental in an unbelievable revival that took place on the Scottish island of Skye in the 1950s. In the 1950s, an unbelievable revival took place. And it gives you the life of Duncan Campbell. Now, that might sound dry to you, but the guy that writes this book, he is amazing. Since then, I've read several more books on that revival. But this book is about Duncan Campbell. That book is so full of, of thoughts and, and um, truths and illustrations of things. And, and you read that book, and you're seeing a man's life, and you're seeing people and their conversations, but it's, it's all legit. It's not made up. It's not a novel. It's, and it's powerful. And I can't, I can't convey, you got to read the book. It's amazing. I got another one. Got it with me today. This is called Letters to a Devastated Christian. It is 45 pages long. Little book by Gene Edwards. Gene Edwards wrote um, A Tale of Three Kings. Now, some of you might say, well, Gene Edwards went off the rails. He's a nutcase. And you know what? I think later on he really did write some crazy stuff. But I'm telling you what, when he wrote this book, do you know anybody has been through a bad church situation? <laughs> do you know anybody that's been through a bad church situation? I've been through two of them and not as a pastor. I sat in the pew, and I sat under some authoritarian, dictator, cultish, Baptist leaders. And I've never in my life dreaded going to church, but this, the last time I was in one of these, and I was trapped. And I just, I fought my feelings, and they play head games with you and all that stuff. Well, what happens with those kind of people when they come out of those churches is those churches eventually implode or they drive those people off eventually. And those people are scarred for life. And they either, they either go on or they chuck everything. And they don't ever want to be under another pastor. And they don't ever want to be in another independent Baptist church. This is the book. And by the way, I don't think Gene Edwards, he, he's a... Uh, He's not, he doesn't mention Baptists. He mentions several movements. There are, there are things that are common denominators in all those cultish movements and in those leaders. And he also points out why people follow them. And he's writing this as he's writing it to a friend who has abandoned a church. And he writes six letters to his friend, Ken. He said, Ken, he said, you can't throw out the church because of what you went through. He said, first of all, Ken, he said, part of this is your fault. He said, you got sucked in. And he said, you got to always remember that God guides your steps. And he said, he said, you need to learn from this amazing book. Amazing. Letters to a Devastated Christian. The writings of E.M. Bounds, the books on prayer have helped me. I've revisited them over and over and over. Two more authors, Tozer, A.W. Tozer, and Vance Havner. Now, you won't, you won't like everything they write, but good grief. Amazing, amazing stuff. Occasionally you'll find a book and it'll be out of print. I was looking for a book I was trying to find. And um, it was called um, The History of the Jesuits by Giovanni Nicolini. And I just come across this book years ago in a thrift store and I never bought it. And I kicked myself over and over and over again that I never bought it. And I tried to find it. You can find the book. The problem is every site that carries it and it's been reprinted, they're all damaged. 
like, and I, I wonder who did that. But they're all damaged. And I thought, but I kept looking. You know where I found it? I found it online, PDF, a university archive, complete. You say, what'd you do? I printed all 600 pages off. There you go. <laughs> that, that's what to do when you're looking for a book that's out of print. He believes in books. You, you have to admit that. Number three. This is Brother Kyriopoulos. You've got a couple blanks in there. Why is it so important for a church and the people in a church to be involved in evangelism? Again, why is it so important for a church and the people in a church to be involved in evangelism. Brother Kyriopoulos, if you'd come, again, his church is pretty involved in it. And, of course, Luigi is from his church. And you could sit in the edge of your chair listening to all the crazy things that Luigi did to get the gospel, running from people that were offended. And yet he kept pressing. So, go ahead. Amen. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 16. Acts 1.8. <clears throat> Actually, let's just go to Mark 16 first. Mark chapter 16. <clears throat> evangelism. When we say evangelism, we mean getting out there and preaching the gospel in the community. Okay. Mark chapter 16. Okay. Now, Mark chapter 16, verse 15. You know the verse. It says there, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, every creature, okay? Uh, even the, you don't exclude anybody when it comes to evangelism. You preach to everything out there, okay? You don't pinpoint the ones that you like or the ones that you think would be the most receptive. You preach the gospel to every creature. Now, I, uh, you know, I have had arguments about this with certain people because they just think certain people are too closed to preach to. But the Lord did say to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. Now, we personally cannot be in all parts of the world at the same time, which is why we support missionaries. And I think that this here collectively applies to the church, that the church should be involved in worldwide Missions outreach, of course. But uh, we have attempted to preach the gospel to every creature in the city of Montreal. It's very simple because there's creatures everywhere. <laughs> you know, I mean, you just you go stand on the street corner, there's creatures, creatures everywhere. So you just preach to them. And uh, you give them gospel tracts and you tell them how to be saved. And uh, for all the times that we've gone out there and preached the gospel and given out gospel tracts, I could probably count... Um, you know, on the fingers, on my fingers, how many times we actually led somebody to the Lord. But uh, it, it, that's not the point. The point is that we are commanded by the Lord to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We, uh, me and a friend, uh, we uh, went to the very, um, we went to the Jewish community, uh, you know, last winter, or the winter before actually, and uh, I had some tracts written in Hebrew. And um, I said, well, I can't read Hebrew, but I knew they were about the Passover. And I figured, you know, I, I don't like throwing gospel tracts in the garbage. I want to give these out to somebody. So we went to uh, Park Avenue, and where there's a lot of uh, Jews there, Hasidic Jews. I think they're probably the descendants of the Pharisees. It's just, you know, very religious sect of, of Jews that they are. And so, um, you know, we were giving them out. Now, they wouldn't take them, but once in a while, somebody would. And one man, he took it, and of course, it was written in Hebrew, and it had a picture of the Passover lamb on it. And he took that gospel track, and he, and he, and he looked at me, and he said, thank you. And I said, God bless you. And I started to walk away, and I took 10 steps. And then he said, hey! <laughs> because as he read, he saw that it was about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he started, hey, what did you know? And he you know, rip, and rip, and rip and rip and he just threw it. That happens when you go out there and preach to every creature. Now, you know, we, we, then we found one of the back streets where um, somebody was stuck. He couldn't get out of the snowbank. So me and my friend, we went there and we pushed the car out to give that guy a gospel track. <laughs> Jewish man. He took it. He was a little more open, you know. But these things happen when you preach the gospel to every creature. And I'll go to Mark chapter number 5. Mark chapter number 5. We just understand here that the Lord wants us to go out there and preach to every creature. Okay? 
to all the people. Mark chapter number 5, and this is talking about the healing of the maniac. And it says there in Mark chapter 5, verse number 18, And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed of the devil prayed him that he might be with him, howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. So have we been doing that? Do we do that regularly? Have we been telling people about what the Lord's done in our lives? Well, if we don't tell them, how are they going to know? The Bible says, how shall they hear without a preacher, right? Let's go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter number 1. When you get to Acts chapter number 1, you know the verse here, verse 8. The Bible says in Acts 1 verse 8, the Lord Jesus Christ speaking, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. You've got to go out there and be a witness to everybody. Um, there's some things that I find evangelism has done for our church and has done even for me personally. But I would say, first of all, that evangelism fuels your fire. Evangelism really does fuel your fire. It... it it, it, it does something internal. You know, uh, a lot of times I go out to a, to a subway station. That's where, that's where we usually go. Uh, we've been going there for many, many years. We've been going to a, uh, a particular subway station that we give out gospel tracks. And um, funny things happen. Funny things happen. You get a lot of stories from public evangelism. A lot of things to look back to and laugh about. I think one of the preachers was talking about that the other night. But I could tell story after story of things that have happened, comical things, you know. And uh, I remember one time in particular when we were uh, preaching and we were holding up a big sign that said, Hell is real, Jesus Christ saves, you know. And we were holding it up. And there was one particular bus driver, that was a bus terminal. He'd come there and he just hated us, you know. And every time he'd come there, he'd, you know, he'd mock. And, but, but there was always the lineup of people waiting to get on the bus. And so, you know, he'd come there and he would just honk, you know, he'd just blow that horn real loud so he could drown us out, you know. And we'd keep going, and we'd keep going, and we'd keep preaching. And the next time he came around, he did his tour, he came back, and he parked again. And we're preaching away, we're preaching away to all the people sitting on the bus, and they're waiting for the bus to leave, and they're just looking at us, and they're listening, and they're listening. And all of a sudden, he just comes out, and he says, Hey, ici au Québec, on parle en français. You know, he's like, we're in Quebec here, you ought to be speaking French. You know. Well, he didn't know that on the back of that sign, we had the same thing translated in French. <laughs> so... So the guy's holding up the sign and he just turns it and it goes and now it's in French and the guy preaching suddenly, I mean on a dime, it wasn't planned, just starts going off in French. And all the people on the bus started laughing at that bus driver. And he looked like a fool. Okay. But funny things happen. We've given out gospel tracts. We're driving down the highway, and there's a car, and we're going like 100 kilometers an hour, and the guys will be, you know, lowering the windows and sticking their arm out on the highway to give the gospel tract to the guy, and they'll take it. They'll take it. You know, we've seen that happen before. But funny, exciting things. But I really believe that it's something that we should be involved in. It fuels your fire. A lot of times, I go out, I go out to evangelizing, and and and. We're not always all there. There's not always a good crowd. Sometimes there's only a few of us when we go. But when we do go, I, I like to bring my Bible and read the book of Jeremiah while, you know, there's a little bit of a lull and there's not many people walking by. But you get the chance to witness to Muslims. You get the chance to witness to atheists. You get the chance to witness to Buddhists. You get the chance to witness to Hindus. Then you get the, you get the chance to witness to everything. And it really, and to get into debates with people like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and what have you. But it really does sharpen you. It sharpens you. Because a lot of times they'll throw questions at you you might not be prepared for. But it really does sharpen you and forces you to study. One of my experiences I had one time was somebody told me, he was from one of these, I don't know what the denomination is, but they believed, they, they were Christian by name, but they believed that if you're saved, you don't sin anymore. That's what he believed. He said, I haven't sinned in 12 years. That's what the guy told me. I said, well, you must be God. <laughs> you know, that's, I don't know, you know, only God doesn't sin. But, uh, I mean, he, he threw that verse in First John at me, you know, about he that is born of God cannot sin. And I was still new in the Lord and young in the Lord, and I, I, it, it really did, it, it, I, didn't, I didn't know what to do with it. And it forced me to go back home and study my Bible and get the answer. And thank God I finally got the answer. But... Um, Definitely, definitely, it does sharpen you. Now, you know, we've had debates with Jehovah's Witnesses, with Mormons. We've had 
uh, people threaten to hurt us and to hit us. Or, you know, uh, Muslims have, uh, you know, a few times, you know, they've gotten really, you know, uh, you know, visibly aggressive. Um, but uh, I'll give you a couple of things I think it does for us. It fuels your fire. You know, it, it gives you victory over the fear of man. You know, the Bible says in one place that the fear of man bringeth a snare. So it has to, you have to have victory over the fear of man. Okay? Now, what did the church pray for in Acts chapter 4? If you turn to Acts chapter number 4, when the church was being threatened, notice what their prayer request was. Okay? Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 29. It says, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. So what we need to do is be praying for boldness. Pray for boldness. Even Paul made that request to the church of Ephesians. He says, pray for me that, uh, that I may open my mouth boldly. Utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel. And one thing I find evangelism has really done, it has given us victory over the fear of man. The fear of man. The fear of man brings the snare. And it, it, it cultivates boldness in us to where we are not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of our spots we've been going to a lot lately is uh, downtown on Friday nights. After Friday night, we have a children's ministry, young people uh, and young teens. And then we go downtown and we bring uh, music and we, uh, we play. And, and uh, you know, we run into, all, you know, you run into homosexuals, man, a lot of them. A lot of them, young people walking around, you know, boys with lipstick on them and all that stuff. And you know what we do? You preach to them. You preach to them. You say, why? Well, he said every creature. He said every creature. It's a soul. There's a soul taken captive in there. Um, one guy in particular, he, got, he was, we had young teens, and he started to come out there and visibly threaten our kids. Like he would raise his hand and raise a fist and all that. And uh, the, we had one man that came to, with us, and, you know, his background is not important for you to know, but anyways, it was, you know, he has one of those backgrounds, tough background. And he just stood there the whole time, you know, you know, you know why Italians have short necks? Because they're always in front of the judge going, I don't know, I never heard of him. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> this guy has no neck. He's like this, he just, look, he just looks at you by turning his eyes. <laughs> and he's just out there, and he's wearing a hat that says, Jesus loves you, and he's like this. And he's just waiting for somebody to threaten somebody, you know. He's looking for that opportunity. To do. <laughs> and this guy, he comes out, and he raises his hand to the young teens. And so this guy from our church, with that hat on his head, you know, with no neck, he walks up to him, and he says, you ever do that again? He says, I'm going to smack you so hard, your mother won't recognize you. And the guy looked at him and said, oh, yeah, well, would Jesus do that? He said, no, Jesus wouldn't do it, but I would. That's what he said. <laughs> All right, so it does fuel your fire, that's for sure. Now, let's go also to the book of uh, 2 Corinthians. Go to 2 Corinthians and uh, chapter 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And I have found this, that a lot of people are a bit afraid and timid and ashamed to go out and evangelize or to witness, but it always helps when you're together. When you're with a group, it helps you be more bold. It really does. It helps you be more bold, okay? And second Corinthians, now I'm not saying go out there and be obnoxious, and that's what, I don't like the idea of going out there and just being obnoxious and rude to people, but there's nothing wrong with going out there and taking some instruments and singing some hymns and doing a little bit of preaching and giving out some gospel tracts. And I remember one time, recently during COVID, we were giving out tracts and the Lord told me, he said, just go out there and smile and show people that you can still smile because people can't even smile anymore. Go out there and smile and uh, I always you know, get, you know, something to read, you know, and they'll say, what is that? It's about the Lord Jesus Christ, about heaven. And I start, you know, going off and telling them how to be saved. But the smile is important. I believe that. I believe it's very important to go out there with a smile and show people that you're happy. Just like Brother Colson says, I'm happy, you know. All right, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verse number 10 says, Therefore I take pleasure 
in infirmities, in reproaches. You see that word? In reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And if you notice, the previous verse talks about the power of Christ resting upon us. And I truly believe that evangelism gives power to us. Okay? It gives power. Notice that word in there, reproaches, infirmities. Now, maybe you don't have an infirmity. Maybe you're not dealing with an illness. Maybe you're not being persecuted or you don't have any necessities. But you can get reproached for the Lord. Okay? And the Bible says in Hebrews 13, verse 13, let's go to Hebrews 13, verse 13. Hebrews 13, verse 13, it says, Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. A lot of the reasons why we stand out in the street corner, hold up a Bible, and preach to people is just to bear his reproach. I believe that's just to bear his reproach. I mean, you're not going to, like I said before, there's a few people that we have won, but a lot of times we go out there just to bear his reproach. Well, the Bible tells us to do that. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And when you find 1 Peter chapter 5, look with me in verse number 13. First, first Peter, oh, sorry, 1 Peter 4 verse 13. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Man, I really believe that. You get reproached for the name of Christ and God will give you some spiritual happiness and glory. It says, it says that. That's what it says. It gives power. It gives uh, joy. It gives happiness to get out there and get reproached for the name of the Lord. I'll give you another one. I believe it does win some souls. <laughs> it does. Like I said before, I, I, I mean, we, I can count you know, probably on my fingers how many times somebody got saved, but... The Bible does say to go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, I'll get, I'll get into a Tim Hortons sometimes, and I'll bring my Bible. I know the Tim Hortons where all the Greek old gentlemen sit down, and they come, and they, you know, and they discuss world events and politics, and they're, they're solving the world's problems, you know. And so I'll sit there with my Bible, and I'll get chances and opportunities to witness to them. But a lot of times, and I'm ashamed to say it, that, like the Lord deals with me, give them all tracks. And it's like, I, 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 hate, I hate to use the term, but I kind of chicken out, you know. And, and then I walk out, and like I get that feeling inside me, like the Lord gave Peter, you know, like, did you deny me? You know. Um, but, it, it, you know, you get out there, they don't, they don't always listen. But um, it does win some souls. I remember one time we were giving out gospel tracts in the subway station and there's escalators, you know, people coming up the steps and one man came up and he took the track and he looked at it and he looked up to heaven and he went, finally. <laughs> uh, he, he had been looking for somebody to witness to him. We led him to Christ there on the spot. The week before that he had been hit by a bus and survived and ended up in the hospital and God put the fear of God in him that he needs to make sure he's saved. Another man was getting ready to jump. You know, one of the biggest ways of committing suicide in the city of Montreal is people jump in front of the subway. We have a subway driver in our church. He's had it happen to him once or twice. Somebody jumped, right, I mean, literally plunged to their death. He said, I ran over that person and heard him screaming in pain as the train cut him in pieces. There was a man who came there getting ready to go downstairs and jump he took the track, sat down, we witnessed him, and he got saved. And he didn't go through with it. Now, this is, uh, this, these stories accumulate from years and years and years of doing this. But I have had discussions with people, one person in particular that I think of, a friend of mine, who says, all that stuff doesn't work anymore. He says, you need to go out there and build friendships, and you need to go out there and, you know, this kind of like a, this contemporary thing of being, you know, going out there and I forget all the wording exactly, but, you know, just making friends and building relationships and through your businesses and what business contacts. And, of course, we, we do make contacts with people and friendships and then we invite them to church. But the Bible does say to go door to door. And the Bible does say there in the early days that they went out publicly and preached the gospel. And even though people don't always get saved there on the spot when you're doing this, is what I believe, bro. I believe that if you do that, 
God brings people to the church. You may, not, you may not always have the people that you're witnessing to and preaching to on the street that are on the spot. They may not come to church, although we have had some do that. But I believe if a church does that in obedience to God, that God blesses it and God brings people in. And I believe that it's a work of God. It's a work of God. I'll, I'll give you one more thing. The Bible tells us when you go out and get reproached, you get rewarded in heaven. That's one thing we don't talk about enough is the judgment seat of Christ. You know what the Bible says at the judgment seat of Christ? The Lord is going to be an austere man. We think he's the Lamb of God. Yeah, at the cross, when he saved us, he was the Lamb of God, gentle. But when we stand before him at the judgment seat, he's going to be an austere man, tough. What did you do with the gifts I gave you? And when it comes to dealing with his servants, he's going to deal with us as an austere man. All right, I'm going to stop there. I guess that's it for me. That's it. Number four. Number four is who are the men that have had a major influence in shaping your life and ministry and why? Again, who are the men that have had a major influence in shaping your life and ministry and why? Brother Newman. Okay, look at um, 1 Corinthians 4.16. We're just going to look at two or three verses real quick. 1 Corinthians 4, 16. Now, you know, we're going to, I'm going to just tell you some folks that, that have really, in, on, down the path of life, they really had a major impact on me. Some of them I never spent much time with. Some of them I spent no time with. But just there was this providential meeting on the path of life. And, um, and man, they, God used them to really do something. Um, most of the names I'm going to mention, you don't know. There may be one or two. And um, uh, you might know one or two of these guys, and you might not like them. And, 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 but what you have to realize is this. You know, no man is perfect. No man is perfect. And um, um, yet, and, and Paul wasn't perfect. But look what the Bible says. Look what Paul said, okay? 1 Corinthians 4, verse 16. He says, wherefore I beseech you. Be ye followers of me. Look at chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 1, Paul said, Be ye followers of me, as, even as I also am of Christ. And, you know, that's always the qualifier. You know, um, you know, how, how, you know, and it's always a bad sign, you know, when some, you know, earthly guy is trying to dominate your life and, you know, and all that. But, you know, we're not talking about that. Um, How, how far do you, you follow some guy? Well, I, if as long as he's leaning in the right direction, if he's following Christ, and I, I realize we're, we're following Christ, but you know, there's people that are going to impact your life, and, um, and, and you're gonna, you, they're going to help you down the road. Um, um, Aquila and Priscilla uh, took Apollos unto them. Apollos was a good guy, but he needed some help, and they took him under their wing, and they... Uh, showed him the way of God more perfectly. And Apollos, I'm sure all his life, remembered the part that Priscilla and Aquila played in his life. Look at Titus 2, verse 7, real quick. Titus 2, verse 7. Uh, Paul writes to Timothy, and he says this. To, to, uh, Paul writes to Titus in Titus 2, 7. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. And what do you do with a pattern? Well, you know, you, you follow a pattern. You follow a pattern. And so um, yeah, and Paul writes to Titus, he said, make sure that, you know, you, you, you live in such a way that somebody can follow your pattern. Um, one of the guys that, that, and Pastor brought this up the other night privately when we were talking, was um, a, a man by the name of Dr. Don Green. Don Green just died a, uh, a year or so ago. And, um, uh, but a lot of years ago, I was 18, and um, I was in my first year of Bible school. And uh, I had just, just gotten saved several months before that. And um, I wound up in this little singing group that the college had that they would send out this little group to, rec to uh, sort of represent the school and promote it. And so there was, you know, about 12 of us, and we went with a couple adults, and we had this little tour we did. We wound up in a church in Lansing, Michigan. And um, I will never forget that night as long as I live. It 
absolutely changed me forever. Man, you just never know what's going to happen. And uh, we got up and did our thing and, and uh, that night, and then Dr. Green got to preach. And Dr. Green was one of those guys, you know, in, Dr. Green was in his prime. That was, a, that was 40 years ago. Dr. Green was in his prime. And Dr. Green, he was sort of like a locomotive, sort of slow getting down the track. But a few minutes in, he had built up a head of steam. And then it wasn't long, he was peeling the paint off the walls at about 120 decibels. And he wasn't just screaming, he had something to say. And man, the thing I remember is the invitation that night. Suddenly it was invitation time. And uh, the altar was full. There was probably 150, 200 people there that night. And this was Dr. Green's crowd. This was his church. And um, the altar was full. And um, the piano was playing. And, and all of a sudden, I saw a guy. Now, some of you are going to think this is wacko. And, and, and I grew up all my life. I, I always thought that people that shouted and praised the Lord were goofy, crazy. You know, you attribute it to personality or whatever. And, um, but I thought they were mentally unstable because the only guys I'd ever seen do it growing up were unstable. And, um, um, you know, we, we sing about it in our songs, don't we? You know, and, you know uh, uh, we, we sang it this week. Um, there's words in the song talking about shouting the glory. You know, and let me say this real quick. I'm not saying everybody, everybody's got to do that. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just going to tell you what I saw. And all of a sudden, one of these guys gets up from the altar. He's just been praying. He gets up. He goes, Whoo! And he's, he is, I mean, he has hit 220. He has hit 220. There are people across the, there, some people were weeping. They were sobbing. Something was going on in that building. And I'm standing there. I'm 18 years old. And I sensed something that suddenly for the first time in my life, I had sensed it before off and on, but something was flooding that room. And it was the presence of Almighty God. And I'm there and I'm 18. And I'm not, I haven't grown up in this. And I'm there going, and I had a thought. And I thought, God is here. And I'm just taking all this in. And this went on. The service that night went till almost 11 o'clock. And um, then I had another thought. I thought, this is what church is supposed to be like. You know what I grew up in? It was dead and dry. And this was alive. Why is it alive? I came that you might have life and that more abundantly. And not everybody shouts and screams. Like I said, some people, some people cry, some people laugh, some people just bow their head and just say, thank you, Lord. Boy, the, the, one of the other services, uh, somebody got up and started playing Spirit of the Living God, Fall Fresh on Me. It was, I don't know who had just preached. And... Um, and I just, I felt something. And I said, oh God, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And all of a sudden, I was ruined for life. I walked out of that service, and I made this decision in my heart. I swore in my heart. You know, I was in Bible college. I thought, if I can ever find a church like this, I'm going to join it. And that put me on a search. Eventually, I found one, found another, and life went on, life moved on. And, um, but I experienced something that was really real. And I talked to Dr. Green years later, and I rem reminded him of that night. And Dr. Green said to me, he said, you know, Brother Newman, he said for 10 years, 10 years, he said our church was in revival pitch. And... Um, you know, is, is, is every, every church like that? Is every service like that? No. I wish my church was like that. <laughs> but you know what we do? We pray, we pray, we pray, and we say, oh, God, please come. And you know, often, and, and my people aren't, I shout, I got a few that wave their hands and all that stuff. Um, and, but you know, um, there's nothing like the presence of God, and that, that service Dr. Green, it changed my whole view of church and the purpose of it and what it was all about. It changed it forever. Um, another guy, and uh, some of you are going to have a heart attack, but I'm going to say it anyway, is Dr. Peter Ruckman. 
you know, you know who, and you say that, and you say, well, you know, right away you got all these things, and I, and I understand that. Just so take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. I don't endorse everything he says or does, but you know, you know why I'm here tonight. Do you know I'm here tonight? Because when my dad was 40 years old, a guy he worked with invited him to church, and a few weeks later, dad got saved, and that preacher and that guy that invited dad to church. They had been, that guy, same guy, he had been a one of Dr. Uckman's preacher boys. You know, people hate Dr. Uckman. And, you know, and I understand why some people really have a beef with him. But all I can say is, you know, it's hard for me to hate the guy that's responsible for my dad's salvation. Um, man, oh man, there's so much I could say. Um, so I keep it really brief, but dad got saved and then we started getting the Bible Believers Bulletin, which was a newsletter that they printed. And then dad would get the odd tape. And then on one of those ensemble trips with the college, a guy gave me two tape albums of Dr. Uckman. And, um, and then I got to see him in person a few times. And, um, you know, all these people hate Dr. Uckman. A lot of that is fed from the outside somewhere. Um, you know, Dr. Uckman in his latter days, I think he got really cynical and he was always just very caustic and sarcastic. Um, but I tell you what, I tell you what, um, I, I've, a lot of these people that hate him, they've never listened to him. They've never been where he preached. All they know is some bull somebody fed him. That's all they know. And I've been in some of those services and I've been in, a, in, a, in an auditorium of 600 people and he's preaching and he was famous for preaching and drawing at the same time. And I mean that audience is spellbound in the hand of God Almighty was at work in that building. And, uh, you know, I, I, saw, I saw a real man. He was fearless. He was hated for many reasons. But, you know, he was not afraid of men or of the crowd of preachers. He was a champion for God. Kurt Bork saw his signature in my wife's Bible and um, my, Kurt Bork is looking at my wife's Bible, and he, he pointed to Dr. Ruckman's name, and he goes, now there's an old soldier of the cross. And um, he impacted my life for Jesus Christ. The third guy that I talk about much is a man named Kurt Bork. How many of you know or have met or have heard Kurt Bork? Did you Oh, man. Um, he was a shantyman. The shantyman traveled in the north. Kurt Bork was one of God's unknowns. You know, he never, his name never made headlines. But, um, but he would travel in the north into the logging camps. Uh, and he would hike into the wilderness with a, with a backpack on his back with Bibles and tracts. And he would sometimes carry a film projector back in the days when you know, they had the reels of projectors. He would go into those logging camps, those rough places. And he'd preach to those men and, and he would show them gospel films. And, and on his long walks through the wilderness, he would memorize scripture. My wife met him as a teenager and I heard about him through my wife. She said, oh, she said, he gets up and he quotes volumes of scripture and and, um, and I heard him in Pickle Lake. I met him when he was about 80 years old. And he came, he was there that morning preaching. His son-in-law preached that night. He gets up and he starts preaching. And, and Kurt Bork all of a sudden would just, at some point in his message, he would just launch. And he started quoting Ephesians. But it was like, I'm sitting there and I'm listening and he is coming alive. And he's 80 years old and he's feeling Ephesians while he's quoting it. Verse after verse after verse after verse. And I thought, this is probably what the way Paul would have said it. I'll never forget the first time I met him. He walked through the door. He walked through the door of, of Pickle, that church in Pickle Lake. And he comes up and my wife greets him. And, and Mitzi goes, this is my husband Joe. And he goes, he goes, glory to God. Good to meet you, brother. <laughs> that was Brother Bork. You know, I saw him. You know what? I, you know what? Joy. I don't know how you are. Maybe you're drawn to depression. If you are, I don't know about you, but, but, but joy draws people like a magnet. And instantly, I thought, I don't know this guy, but I want what he's got. He absolutely shined. He vibrated with Jesus Christ. And then uh, he uh, he sent me some books. Uh, he was a joyful witness. He was an out-of-the-box kind of a witness. You know, if you use the Romans Road all the time, and that's great, and that's a tool. But you got to remember, you know, sometimes you can do something out of the box. 
and you don't always have to run down that same rail. And um, um, he was up in Pickle Lake, and um, the pastor there said, um, uh, Brother Bork, would you go visit the doctor with me? Now, Pickle Lake's way up north, little town of about 500 people at that time. And the, the doc, uh, the pastor of the church was a veterinarian, and so he had a connection with the doc. The doc was an old military doctor, been through the war, and he was 80 years old. Now, he, he looked good for 80. He looked about 65, the, the, the town doc did, and his name was Dr. Von Erbing. Now, let me tell you his nickname, and this will tell you about something about him. They called him Dr. Von Vodka. Okay? And, uh, you know, like one of my kids, you know, they needed help one night, and, um, and it had a finger. It was actually Levi. And he had his finger. He got it horribly disfigured in the... And so we went, and the, the doc sort of did his deal on it, and I looked at it, and I went, eh. And then we went to the vet, and the vet fixed it. But, 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 but Dr. Von Erbing, Dr. Von Erbing, uh, bro, brother, uh, brother um, the, the preacher says, come with me. He said, I want you to see if you can talk to Dr. Von Erbing. Dr. Von Erbing had been through the wars. He'd seen it all. He was a military doctor, rough as a cob and hard as nails. And they go up to the door, and, of course, they exchange greetings. And, and then um, the pastor said, you know, we just wanted to talk to you about the Lord for a minute. And Dr. Von Erbing's like, oh, yeah, I'm really not interested and Kurt Bork, with his, his just his lively smile, another 80-year-old man, says, before we go, he says, I want to read you something. He said, I want you to tell me what it does to you. And Dr. Ernie said, okay. And Kurt Bork began to read Psalm 23. Actually, he quoted it as only Kurt Bork could do. He's working through verse after verse in tears. Start coming to that old doctor who's hard as nails. And then the doc said, the old doc, Dr. Von Irving said, he said, you know, he said, before we would send men off into battles that we knew they would never return, he said, the chaplain would always read Psalm 23. And Dr. Von, Ir Dr. Von Irving didn't get saved that day. But all I'm saying is, Brother Bork just had this way, he just out of the box. And God... God greatly used him. There was an incident where uh, a friend of mine ran across Brother Bork when he was 93. Brother Bork now was, had, was blind in one eye and was very hard of hearing. But uh, Kurt Bork was in Winnipeg at the prophecy conference. And my friend was there. So all of a sudden he sees Brother Bork. And he goes up to him. And um, he goes up and greets Brother Bork. And, you know, Brother Bork, you know, uh, he said, Oh, glad to see you, brother. And then he goes, he goes, now he's 93 and he's blind in one eye, hardly here. There remains yet much land to be possessed. <laughs> you know what Brother Bork was doing in his 80s? In his 80s, I'll never forget. He comes to Pickle Lake and he says, yeah, he says, me and my wife, he says, we've got a competition going. And I think it was the book of 1 John. It was a small book in the Bible. He said, we're competing to see who can memorize it first. Let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his. I met an old man who was a missionary and um, his name was Randy Pike. And I was a young missionary just getting started. I was about 23, 24. And I was at this mission conference at, at Jack Woods Church. And... Um, Brother Randy Pike was there. Brother Randy Pike was in his 50s. If Brother Pike is still alive, and I think he is, he's, he's just an invalid. But in those days, and Brother Pike was one of those guys, he got injured in a football accident when he was 17. And he never walked normal after that. He had braces on both legs, and he walked with uh, the, those canes, you know. And, uh, but he had been to South Africa. He had been uh, in Africa. He had been in Australia. And he had been in some really rough places as a missionary. And um, so I... I went up to him. The service was about to start. It was a few minutes before it was going to start. And he was on the platform. And, you know, there's just something about Brother Pike. He was just, just one of those guys, sort of in the same caliber of these guys. And I, uh, I said to Brother Pike, I said, Brother Pike, I said, I'm young. 
I said, I'm just getting started. I said, can you tell me anything that would help me? And he didn't miss a breath. He said, yeah, I'll tell you two things right now. At that time, we were coming to Canada to work with the native Indians in Pickle Lake. He said, Brother Newman, he said, you're going to work with those Indians. But he said, but I want to tell you something. He said, don't lose your, your kids. Don't lose your family for the ministry. He said, if you never win an Indian to God, he said, make sure you win your children. I never forgot that. And then he said, and the second thing is this. He said, always remember that if you truly live for God, he said, you will suffer. He said, always remember that. These are some men that really helped me on the road of life. That, that few minutes with Dr. Pike, that's the only time I ever talked to him. You never know what you're going to say to somebody. You may never see them again. And they will remember it forever, and it will help them. Amen. We've got two more questions to go. Number five, what are some of the lessons that you learned in your ministry in Nova Scotia? For the Kyriopolis pastor there for 10 years, of course, went out of Montreal to there. Again, what are some of the lessons that you learned in your ministry in Nova Scotia? All right. Well, uh, for those of you who don't know, I was not raised in a Christian home. I was, um, I was raised in a religious home, um, Greek Orthodox. I heard the gospel when I was 18 years old. I was uh, raised in the Greek community, and um, we, all we knew was religion. All we knew was um, you, you go to church, you, you kiss the image, you, uh, you um, do your cross, you light a candle. Uh, you do them about three times a year, and you're good, you know. But, um, you know, you, know you, you don't know anything about salvation. You don't even understand anything the priest is saying because it's all chanted in an ancient language. Um, but we were, you know, that was the mindset. And I got saved at the age of 18 years old. I had gotten messed up my life. You know, I was, I was a good kid when I was little. But then after I, when I became a teenager, and we started messing around with the world and with drugs. That's when everything just kind of went downhill. And I thank God that he saved my soul and he took me out of that. Uh, but I fell in love with the Lord. I really did. I fell in love with God. And uh, God started doing with my heart about preaching. Uh, our church uh, was started by a missionary, uh, Pastor Larry Theophanopoulos. He was a missionary in Greece for about 12 or 13 years. And then he came back to the States due to health issues. And he didn't know what the Lord was going to do with him until um, he met some of the young men who were saved in Montreal and uh, they met him down at Pensacola Bible Institute, and then he, uh, he surrendered to come up to Montreal and start what is today the Bible Baptist Church. And that's why I started learning the Bible. But after about a few years, the Lord started dealing with my heart about preaching, and um, I knew God wanted me in Canada. I just didn't know where. And so uh, the Lord opened the door for me to, to go to Nova Scotia, and it was clear as day that the Lord wanted me there. And um, at the beginning, everything just seemed so right. Everything just seemed so perfect at the very beginning. And everybody loved me and I loved them. And I was young at the time. I was only about 23 years old. My wife was 23 years old too. We were just getting started. We were newlyweds. And we went out there with these, you know, with, with this vision of grandeur that this is going to be the most amazing, <laughs> wonderful thing, experience that you can possibly think of. Um, but uh, six months in to that, I, I don't know what was brewing in the background. We had taken over a church that had some problems that were covered up. And uh, I was young and naive, and I didn't know what they were. But some problems were covered up, and then they just surfaced all at once and took me by surprise, really blindsided us. Uh, and... Um, you know, we had good jobs in Montreal, we were, but our culture was very different. But we, we had good jobs in Montreal. And when we went to Nova Scotia, I mean, we, we surrendered everything. We, we cashed in all the chips that we had at that time. And we bought a house there. We anchored ourselves in. And then just kind of everything just fell apart in one, just in one week, it seemed. Like, and just everything just kind of took us by surprise. And so um, anyway, you know, I didn't know what to do. 
I really didn't know what to do. And um, my wife said, you need to start your own church. <laughs> so she said, you just need to start your own church. And uh, so that's what I did. And I started another church, and the Lord really blessed it. Um, there's some things that I learned out there. I stayed there 10 years. All my children are born there. That's where I cut my teeth. That's where I learned. But that's where I was trained. I believe that that was schooling. I really believe that. I really believe that that was schooling for me. You know? And now 10 years after that, being there, God again took me by surprise and called me back to my home church in Montreal. <laughs> Or my pastor was getting ready to move on and retire due to health issues and age and all that. And um, I have been the pastor of the Bible Baptist Church since 2011. But it's, it's, it's two different places, completely different. Um, what I learned in Nova Scotia was that you cannot change a culture. You can only adapt to it. Um, I, it, let me show you something. Go with me to Acts chapter 17. You cannot change a culture. You can only adapt to it. Now, I was young, and if I was to look for a quality in somebody, that a missionary that I was getting ready to support, is their adaptability. I'm not saying that they have to change what's been ingrained in them all their life. I'm not saying all that. But there must be some adaptability. There must be some ability to adapt to where the Lord has placed you, okay? Now, in Acts chapter 17, Paul the Apostle is preaching to the Athenians, okay? And uh, he's preaching on a place called Mars Hill. It's right off, you know, near the Acropolis. Uh, it, 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 there's a little mountain there that they would just get together and talk and philosophize, you know? And the Greeks like to do that sort of thing. They just like to talk and discuss ideas or whatever. But there was an altar there to the unknown God in verse 23. Well, let's start there in verse 22. It says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Notice that Paul the Apostle didn't get up there and say, You bunch of idiots. <laughs> You bunch of morons. You're so stupid. You didn't do that. He used something of theirs as a common denominator and used that as a launching, as a starting point to give them the gospel. And um, look at verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Now, if you go there today and see what is left of the Acropolis, it is stone, marble stone, but that's just the skeleton. It used to be covered in silver and gold until, you know, invaders have come through and scraped all the, the gold and all the, the silver off it. And inside it, there was a big uh, image to the goddess Athena and, um, you know, that's who they worship. So I could imagine Paul the Apostle pointing towards that place and saying, you know, God's not worshipped in, with gold and silver and, and in temples made with hands, but he's using this altar they have to the unknown God. And I want you to notice something here that's very interesting in verse number 26. He goes on here and he says, And have made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from, one, from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being as certain also of your own Poets have said, for we are also of his offspring. He, he, he um, somehow Paul acquainted himself to the history of those people. And he acquainted himself to what was written in, as their history and their cultural history. He acquainted himself to know enough that he can use it as a way to disarm them when he's giving them the gospel. Now, one person said this one time when they came and visited our church in Montreal. They said, this needs to be a Montreal church. <laughs> I'm not saying it's not a Baptist church. We believe everything that the Baptist uh, doctrine teaches, it's all the same. But this needs to be a 
Montreal church, a church that adapts itself to the cultural habits of the people and not the sinful stuff, obviously not. But, you know, I, I, when I first went to Nova Scotia, the missionary that was the contact that was instrumental in me being there, he said, come, we're going to go visiting. And of course, in Montreal, you know what we did? We did what I just described the last time. We stood on the street corners and preached. Well, that doesn't work much out there. <laughs> because there's nobody. There's nobody walking by. <laughs> Who are we going to preach to? I mean, it's, you, you can't do that necessarily. So this is what he said. We're going to go visit. But they, do ha- he, they had their way of getting the gospel out. And he said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go visiting today. All right. So I just kind of sat there as the passenger. I'm just there to observe what he's doing. And, and so he'd go and he'd stop into somebody's house. Again, unexpected visits, which are appreciated out there. Where I'm from in Montreal, they don't want unexpected visits. That offends people. You have to call first. or You don't just show up and knock on the door. Hey, I'm walking in with my cup of coffee and I'm here to sit down at your table. You know, like, it's, I'm not raised with this at all in my head. Shouldn't we call first to see if they're home to make sure it's a convenient time? No, 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 we'll just go. And so we went over. And he, would, uh, he got out of the car and, and, and he sees, oh, I see over here that you've built a, 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 you know, an addition you know, to, your, to your home. I see a little project, you're doing some renovation. Uh, tell me how you, do, how'd you frame it, what'd you use, where'd you get the materials, oh yeah, where'd you get the special stuff, and, and they just go on and on and on, and this man is telling him about this renovation, this man's telling him about his work that he's done, and, and I'm just sitting there, who cares, man, let's just preach them, give them the gospel, you know, and, and he's just going on and on and on, talking about the work, that he's at his fence, and how he's piling his wood, and this, that, getting ready for winter, or whatever, and then, um, all right, that's it, nice to see you, God, goodbye. I said, that's it? That's visiting out here? And, and he just stops by the way and said, oh, by the way, you know we're having special services down at the church. We'd love to see you come. And that was it. <laughs> and that's how, it, that's how this guy built church. And he did. He started two or three churches out there visiting like that, getting into the cultural habits of those people, which is something that I was not accustomed to. I thought, man, let's go out street preaching. <laughs> but uh, out there where I was, it was a little different. It was a little different. So, you know, you can't really change the cultural habits of a people. You can only adapt and learn to, as much as you can to adapt to it and not to mock it or to preach against it. Uh, secondly, I think I learned that you can't really fix or force people to do right. I've learned that you can't really fix people. You can only help people. I learned that. That's, that's a hard lesson to learn. But uh, you cannot guilt, treat, guilt trip people into doing right. You cannot intimidate people into doing right. Uh, you can only help people who, um, who want to help, who want help. Uh, but you cannot fix or force people to do right. And uh, one thing I, I did say um, is that, uh, I mean, we were raised in a, in a religious, uh, uh, in a religious environment or, or upbringing, and um, it was all nothing but man-made rules. And one of the things I've learned about the Greek Orthodox, when you're talking to Greek people, you're talking to Italian people, they're raised in Catholic churches, they are sick of religion. They're sick of being told by some man, some rule that somebody wrote somewhere, they are just sick of all that stuff. And so when you come and you bring them the Bible and say, this is what the Bible says. Now that really gets into the heart of them because you're saying, you know, there was a man in our church in Montreal named Nick, he passed away now, but he was an engineer. And he, he, he was a very, very studious. He was a professor at the, one of the colleges, and he had studied a lot in his life. He was an engineer. And, you know, for him, it was like God didn't exist because if these priests represent God, then th- there is no God, you know? And, but then when, when somebody, and, and he, he hated that. He hated them. And, he, and uh, one time he said, I, I went to church one time, and, and they were passing the offering plate, and I put 50 cents in there. <laughs> And he said, I walked away saying, man, those suckers, they got me. Because <laughs> you know? he put 50 cents in there, you know. But, but he said, you know, when, when somebody gave him the Bible and opened it up, it was like, for him, it was like, you know, like, just like you sit in an engineering class and you have the book, you have the man, you have the teacher, and then you have the book. Okay, now we're getting somewhere, you know. But, um, you know, when, when those people today see that, that you are trying to impose something that's not found in the book, they say, show me in the book. If you're trying to show, impose something that's not found in the book, you chase them away. 
Uh, people who are raised in Orthodox or Catholic religions, that's all they are. You try to show them something that's not, you, you, that this is what you should do and this is what, and, and okay, where does it say that in the book? It's not in the book. It's just something I heard from another preacher. Or, you know, that, they, right away, when they get away from that, that makes them nervous. That really does make them nervous. So you can't fix people, you can't force people, you can't intimidate people, you can't guilt trip people, but I believe you can only help people who want help. And I, I have made the mistake of pouring too much energy into people who really didn't want to be helped. I, I, they drained me. They drained me. I would go visit, I would try to give lifts, everything back and forth to the point where like, um, you know, even sometimes, you know, setting your family aside and, and, and putting, them, uh, uh, putting them aside so that we can, um, so that we can uh, uh, build a church or whatever, win people, you know, and you, you pour your energy into people who really are not responding. So, you know, one of the mistakes I think that I made is sometimes trying too hard to fix or force people to do right when you really can't. <laughs> you can only help people who want help. And I really believe in the longevity. I, I don't believe necessarily in getting things done immediately, but uh, that uh, 20 something years down the road, I'm still doing this. And that's, that praise, that's where I praise the Lord. I started off in the ministry in, the year, in about 2000. Here we are, 2022, and I'm still going. And I give glory to God for that. And if the Lord tarries another 20 years, I want to keep going another 20 years, but you've got to pace yourself. It's more of like a marathon instead of a sprint. And I, I've made the mistake of trying so hard to pour energy sometimes and force things and fix things and fix every problem. And you just, you can't. You can't do all that stuff, you know. Thirdly, uh, I would say that you just, you can't do everything. This is a big, a hard thing for a guy like me. I don't know, maybe some pastors don't have a problem with it. But uh, somebody said to us years ago, you've got to learn to say no. You got to learn to say no. I have a problem doing that sometimes because I want everybody to be happy. I have a hard time saying no, but sometimes it's the right thing to do is to say no, and to know your strengths and to know your weaknesses and that you can't do everything. I, I think I made a mistake when I was there and I started a Christian school. I didn't know. I'd never been in a Christian school. I didn't know anything about Christian school. I tried to inform myself a little bit about it, and then when I did it, I realized I bit off more than I could chew. Then I was stuck with it. And finally, you know, it just kind of dissolved on its own. But you can't do everything. And I realized that I'm not meant to run a Christian school. I'm a preacher. And if I don't have the staff and I don't have the manpower to do it, you know, then rather than do people a disservice, I better not get involved in it at all. You know, so you can't really do everything. And uh, I learned to be realistic. I learned that in a small town, you're going to have a small church. And you have to rejoice in small blessings. In a small town, you're going to have a small church and just rejoice in small blessings. And, you know, don't number it by the amount of people that are there, that it's quality more than quantity. Uh, I remember being really discouraged at looking out, you know, pouring my heart and hours and hours of labor and labor and study and praying and, you know, just looking out at that small congregation and think to myself, man, I'm so insignificant. I'm not doing anything here. You know, and um, the Lord t dealt with my heart about that once. And, and uh, you know, you have to think about it per population. So I sat down and I calculated how many people attend our church there in Digby, Nova Scotia, comparative to the population of the town. And then I did the same uh, calculation uh, by ratio if I was pastoring in Montreal I would have had 35,000 people in the church <laughs> so that was encouraging <laughs> that was encouraging you know you think about it you know I mean you're in a big city of 4 million people or you're in a town of 3,000 people you got to be a little bit realistic there you know and I remember just kind of, and, and you know, there was an old preacher named B.R. Lakin, and he used to say, they, they used to ask him, do, do you, when you get invited to preach in small churches, do you go preach in small churches? And he said, I don't preach in small churches, because there's nothing small when God's involved in it. It doesn't matter how many people, there's no such thing as a small church that God is in. And that's the mindset you have to get, really kind of get, a, 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 get, um, get in you. Because I really, really tried to, like, you know, bring down the Welsh revival. And I really tried, you know, I went through some of that, you know, that phase where I was going to bring revival to the whole place and everything. And I, I did my absolute best. And I, 
But a lot of times it's just, uh, realistically speaking, I think God just blesses uh, faithfulness. And God just blesses faithfulness. And I just learned that the important thing is for me to be faithful and to serve God. Um, what got me through, what got me through uh, those years was my sense of humor. You've got to have a sense of humor in the ministry. I really believe. You've got to learn how to laugh. I'll tell you a story about a man named Greg Buckler. We were having outdoor services, and Greg Buckler wandered in and got, we used to do these outdoor services during a, during a motorcycle rally that they had every year. And this man came, he wandered in, and he got saved. He was an old radio announcer, so he had a voice that was very proper. You know, he spoke very, like, like a radio. Every time you talked to him, you thought, you know, man, I'm on the radio here, you know. And, and this guy, he trusted Christ as his Savior. And at the end of, the, at the end of re receiving Christ as his Savior, he stood up and testified of how he got saved. And then he said he wanted to start coming to church. Then he said, come to my house, pastor, for a visit. He said, I want to show you something I do. I do something called hypotheoretic prayer. And I thought to myself, what in the world is hypotheoretic prayer? He said, oh, I'm going to show you. So I went to his house, just me and him alone, sitting there in an apartment. He shuts the lights and he turns on this red light. And I'm sitting next to him. He takes off his shirt. He puts a picture of Jesus, what's supposed to be in front of us. I'll tell the story, I'm done. He puts a picture of Jesus in front of him. I'm sitting next to him. He said, now we are going to do hypotheoretic prayer. I said, what is that? He said, well, we are going to talk to Jesus and he's going to talk to us. I said, why do you call this hypotheoretic prayer? And he said, uh, he looked at the picture and he said, um, why do I call it that, Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, well, I guess that's just the word Jesus gave me. Well, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, man, I'm going to offend this guy. The Bible says you're not supposed to worship idols or whatever. This is an image. So I looked at him and I said, you know, Greg, the Bible says you're not supposed to pray to images. You're not supposed to pray to idols and icons. And you're not supposed to be doing this, you know. And I thought, you know, that was it. I offended him. He's never going to come. But as soon as I said that, he said, oh, really? Okay, well, he's gone. He takes the picture and just flings it across the room. <laughs> well, that guy went, he, then he, this is how he would pray. He said, dear Lord, this is Greg Buckler speaking. <laughs> 121 King Street, apartment 12. <laughs> Digby, Nova Scotia. I'm sitting here with Pastor Peter, the man on my right. He's on your left. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm talking about, but you know what? God allowed me to experience, and that's just one little story, but I, I have a lot of stories about that guy. Sense of humor got me through. I'm telling you, you've got to have a sense of humor. You can't take things too seriously and learn to laugh at, at yourself, I'm I could tell story after story about the snow banks we went into and how many times we ended up, you know, with, uh, I mean, we were city people living in a country town and we, we were so, like, this was so different for us, but God, and that's what I learned, just preach the Bible, God build the church. Wherever you go, just preach the book. Yeah. Amen. I was uh, telling someone, we have one question left. I was telling someone last night, I went to Bible College, Bible Institute, North Carolina, Pastor Carl Lackey, and he always took a Greyhound bus with about 30 of the people to where he was going to preach. He was asked to preach often. And so the very first time I went on that bus, I sat near the back. He always sat in the front, passenger side, so we could see. And I went all the way to the front to say something to the bus driver, Brother Tom Delp. And as I turned around, Brother Lackey was opening his briefcase. Oh, man, this old man of God, he must, he must have like reams of message outlines. When he opened that briefcase, there were four things in that briefcase. There was a Bible. There was a rechargeable shaver. There was a change of underwear. And there was a joke book. That's all that he had in that briefcase. And I must have, when I looked down, my jaw must have dropped, and I said, uh, do you need all those things? <laughs> and he said, everyone. And I said, and the joke book too? He said, son, when you preach that people need to live right, 
Some of them are just going to start to stiffen up. And he said, you just got to make them smile. And it's good. It's good to smile way through. Here's the last question. Brother Newman's going to close with this, and we're aiming for 1230 lunch. We have heard that you have some connection to what is called the deeper life movement. Is that true? Again, one more time, we have heard that you have some connection to what is called the deeper life movement. Is that true? Oh, right. The answer to that question is yes. And, uh, and of course, the question, and of course some, people, some people know what that is, some people don't know what it is, and some people, they've got a really, you know, they've got a really um, uh, jaded idea. You know, they've heard something, you know. Um, and it's just like anything. You know, you've got the independent Baptist. When we say that, you've got quite a spectrum. Um, when you say the King James camp, well, in the King James camp, there's quite a spectrum. And the same thing is true of the deeper life. The deeper life flies under a few titles. You'll, you'll, you know, you would see books and about it. It would be the deeper life. It would be the victorious life. They call it the abundant life. That's what it's called. Um, and so beware of running from or dismissing something because of a label. Um, we got this thing in our society, and it's, and it's very much alive in our churches. It's been this way for a long time. And people play this game, and we call it classify and dismiss. You know, they'll be talking to you, and, and, um, or they'll be sitting in the pew, whatever. But you, you've seen it. You've done it. I've done it. Where, but somebody will come up, and they'll talk to you, and they start asking you questions. You know, they're trying to get to know you. They're just trying to feel you out a little bit. And, and all of a sudden, these questions start coming and you're going, oh, okay, I, I know what they're doing. They're trying, to, um, they're trying to figure out where I'm at and, or where you're at. And then, and then they're either going to go, good, or they're going to go, she's one of those. <laughs> and, then, and then you might be the godliest, holiest person. You might be the one that's going to help them. But from that moment on, they don't hear a word you say because they have classified you. Um, so be careful about running from a name. Um, are there some wackos in the uh, uh, deeper life crowd? Sure. Are there wackos in the King James crowd? Sure. Uh, there's wackos in every crowd. Okay. So um, you know what you got to learn to do? You got to learn to be discerning. You got to learn to eat the corn and um, spit out the cob. Um, but all that said, um, I remember, you know, my, my dad got saved when I was six. We grew up in church. A lot of it was really dry. Um, when I say that, I'm not saying church is going to be a three-ring circus. I'm not saying that, um, you know, you're, you're always going to feel wonderful. You're, I'm, I'm not saying that. But I am saying this. Man, I came that you might have life. Man, when you look at Jesus moving through the Gospels, I'm telling you what, it was never boring. Now, there were moments with the disciples where I'm sure they were all wiped out. And they're all sitting around the campfire and they're eating their fish and nobody's saying a whole lot. I'm sure there were moments like that. But you never find anything about being with the Lord that was ever, um, you know, people were going, well, we got to do this again. I really dread this. This is pretty boring. This is dry. I wonder if there's, any, wonder if there's another crowd out there. They, they never did that. They never did that. And, you know, along the way, I saw people. I mentioned Kurt Bork. And Kurt Bork is such a classic example. I saw people, for lack of a better way to say it, they had something. Now, we all know a ton of saved people. And I realize not everybody's the same. I understand that. But I saw some people that had something. You know, they had what we sang about. They had what you heard preached about. And, and we all knew what it was, but we had never seen it. And all of a sudden, I saw it. And I saw joy. And I saw a connection to the Lord. I saw a sensitiveness to the Lord. I saw people that were at rest. Were they, were they perfect? Of course not. But they were at rest and they were confident and they were humbly confident. Man, they weren't worried about what anybody else thought. You know, we know there's always idiots out there like that. But these people weren't like that. They, they just loved the Lord and they, they really weren't worried about whether you like them or not, or thought highly of them, they were just going to serve the Lord. 
And the whole premise of the deeper life movement, and man, we could, you know, this is one of those subjects, you could spend a lot of time on it. But the whole premise of the deeper life movement is they've really got a hold of something. They've got a hold of what's in Romans 6, 7, and 8. And if you read their works, if you hear them talk, you'll hear them talk a lot about that. You'll hear them talk about being crucified with Christ. Uh, Kurt Bork, you know, he would often quote Galatians 2.20. And that, this is one, if there is a poster verse for the crucified life, uh, it's called the crucified life also. Um, if, there's a, if there's a verse for it, it's Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Man, they've really gotten hold of that thing. In Romans 6, you know, it says, For as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. And you know you wrestle with some of this, and, and so I'm going to try to clarify a little bit. Some of these guys make this really deep and really mystical. And really that, that's, that's sort of sad. They, they sort of make it to where it's hard to get a hold of. And you know there's a simplicity in Christ. In the last few years, that verse just comes to my mind over and over and over. Paul says, but I fear lest as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, you should be beguiled from the simplicity that's in Christ. Um, they've just gotten a hold of that thing as many as were baptized into his death. And that's not talking about water baptism. You know, uh, at, 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 at salvation, Jesus Christ, uh, uh, the Holy Ghost took you and he... He, he immersed you. Man, when you're, when you're baptized and you're immersed, you're surrounded, man. You're flooded. Your you're, water's everywhere. And, and the Holy Ghost took you and he plunged you into the body of Jesus Christ. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. And suddenly, somehow, we become connected to Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5, this is eternal security. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bone. We are so, and we'll understand it when we get there. I don't understand it, but I sure like it. We are so united to Jesus Christ. It is beyond anything we can imagine. We are in Christ. He is in us. We are united with Jesus Christ. And, um, and, and so God looks at us and suddenly his history becomes our history. I don't understand it all. But, but, you know, when Jesus Christ died, now that you're a believer, you know what happens? Jesus' life becomes your life. And, and as many as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. And suddenly, suddenly your past, your, your life, it is, it, it suddenly it's nailed to the cross. And, um, and you're baptized into his death. We could say a lot about that. But all that said... So with that said, let me make a comment. Um, there are three schools of Christianity, really. Basically about three. One piece of Christianity we would call the activity-oriented Christianity. There's a lot of Christians out there, they're very activity-oriented. Sometimes it's because that's what they were taught. Sometimes it, it's because it, it appeals to them. Now, you know, hold your breath. I'm going to... Clear, clear, sort of qualify a little bit of this in a minute. But the activity-oriented bunch, man, their whole Christianity is about soul winning. It's about teaching. It's about duties. It's be busy. It's participate. It's, here's, here it is, ready? Do, 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 do. It's do, do. And that's all outward. So you can, remember Pastor Carlson told me about a church he was in many years ago. He said, you could have been a dirty, slimy, immoral rat, but if you could stand up every Sunday night and said you'd won a couple people to the Lord, they thought you were great. I'm telling you, God doesn't think that's great. That's foolishness. So there's the activity-oriented crowd. Then there's the issue-oriented crowd. There's a branch of Christianity that revolves around and again, hear me, like the last bunch, is soul winning important? Yes. Is teaching important? Are, are, are there duties to do? Of course. But some people, that's all their Christianity is. That's what I'm saying. Okay? Then you have the issue-oriented bunch. 
It's, it's standards, it's culture wars, it's LGBTQ, it's abortion, it's, it's new age, it's let's take a stand. Say, Pastor, do you believe in taking a stand? I sure do. I mean, I'm hard as nails in some of this stuff. But the problem is, if that's all your Christianity is, you don't have much. Because what if all the issues were fixed tomorrow? You have nothing. Or what if you're in a hospital bed and you can't talk and you can't move? Because Then you have no more Christianity because all you did was fight issues. Again, it's very outward. But the third branch would be what we call the deeper life. And the deeper life, they, they really major on words like abide, John 15. Abide in Christ. There again, some of them make it really mystical and deep and dark and mysterious. Um, the thought is abiding is just staying. You know, some of you this week, you know, maybe somebody in this room got right with God. Man, haven't we all many times over through our lifetime as believers? We've gotten right with God, and then we get wrong with God, and then we get right with God, and then we get wrong with God. And you know what? What would be wonderful? What would be wonderful is you could just get right with God and abide. Stay there. Um, John Vassar, famous Christian, much like Kurt Bork when you read his history. John Vassar, um, somebody said, do you believe in sinless perfection? And he said this. He said, well, he said, I believe a very high level of Christian experience is possible. He said, the problem is how to stay there. You know what the deeper lifers do? They want to stay there. They want to stay there. You know, they've seen the outward. They've seen the outward. They've seen the outward. And they want something that goes deeper. They're, they're tired of all the shallow stuff. Um, they're, they have some, some terms that are, are good and yet they're not good depending on who you are. They'll say, it's not trying, it's trusting. Um, um, I'm going to try to explain that. You know, there, there's some real truth to that. But you've got to watch some of this phraseology. Um, they, they say, you know, it, it's, you've got to give up on yourself and you've got to look to the Lord. To which I say, yes. The problem is, is if you take that to where that means, you know, well, I really can't do anything. I'm just going to trust the Lord. And that's, that's sometimes deeper lifers, they almost give that impression, and that's a very wrong impression. I think some deeper lifers are actually there, and they don't understand that they've missed the boat. That's not the point. Um... They'll talk about cease from your own work and look to the Lord. And, and I get that. Um, and boy, I've wrestled through all this because I went through a period of my life right after I met Brother Bork and he sent me several books on the deeper Christian life and I devoured those. And I tried to, uh, I tried to um, put them into practice. But you know what I had to learn to do? I had to learn to wrestle through some of their terminology because some of their terminology actually it almost misleads you, and, and their heart's in the right place. But boy, isn't that true with a lot of things people say. If you, if you, don't, if you don't really get a hold of it. So here's my point. You got the activity-oriented, you got the issue-oriented, you got the deeper lifers. And here's the thing. Um, you know what? Christianity is all of the above at the same time. But... B, now listen, B must come before do. You know, you need to, you, you know, your Christian life, uh, Brother Karyopoulos talked about your relationship with the Lord. What you are must be the focus. That what you do must spring out of what you are. Because if what you do doesn't spring out of what you are, it's, it's, it's just a lot of pretense. It's, it's, it's just Outward, there's no enjoyment. There's no relationship. Um, the Bible says we are to be perfect. Perfect is complete. Um, you know, some of you ladies make pies. And, um, you know, uh, you come in the room and, and, and if, if all of a sudden a piece of the pie is missing, um, you know, that, that pie is incomplete. And you've got to have all of these. There, there, there's activity in the Christian life. Uh, man, you've got to do something with the issues. Um, but man, there's got to be something deep between you and Jesus Christ. It must be. Um, it is God which worketh in you 
both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And then God says, work out your own salvation. You work out what God works in. You work out what God works in. So I'm going to give you several authors that are deeper life authors. Um, and you, you really, this first group I'm going to write down, really they're not the ones I want you to focus on. I'm going to be really fast here. There's one called, uh, a writer called Charles Trumbull. Charles Trumbull. He wrote a book called Victory in Christ. Charles Trumbull, Victory in Christ. Now what you'll find when you read these guys is they're all very, very, very similar in their thinking. Um, another one, a famous deep, deeper life writer is J. Gregory Mantle. J. Gregory Mantle. And he wrote a book called Beyond Humiliation. Beyond Humiliation. Another famous one, Hannah Whittall Smith. She wrote a book called The Christian Secret of a Happy Life. Then you got the books of Watchman Nee. And then you'll find some of these guys, they'll, and this is where I, I really deviate from the, the deeper lifers. They'll start quoting the mystics. Like you'll hear names like Madame Guyon, Lady Julian of Norwich, St. John of the Cross. And the problem with that is the mystics, as far as I'm concerned, I do not endorse the mystics because they are generally Catholic. I do not endorse them. Now, here's the thing. Here's the, here's the danger of the deeper life. Could, could most Christians, could, could we all, would it help us to go deeper? Oh, my word. Absolutely. Um, but here's the problem. The deeper lifers, they tend to promote um, a, a, a direct contact between God and your spirit. You know, they're really big on being led of the spirit. That's a good thing. But man, you've got to qualify what that is. And Brother Logan did an excellent job with that. But this direct contact thing, you, you, um, here's what happens. Some of the deeper lifers dwell almost exclusively on this thing of being led of the Spirit, being sensitive to the Spirit. And they take it to an extreme where it becomes very subjective, very it's, it's really just about what you're feeling. And here's the problem with that. When you start living your Christian life heavily that way, the problem is there's very little need for Scripture at that point. You'll find they are generally very weak on sin. Almost no mention of sin. And there's no standard to test anything. Because suddenly you're just, you're just flying by, well, I don't want to even be in bondage and I, I, don't, want to be, I don't want to be a legalist. I want, to, I want to, what does the Spirit want me to do? Well, you know what? A whole lot of that is written down. It's, a whole lot of that is very clear. The problem is it becomes very, very feeling and experience oriented. Much of the modern church is here. Much of the modern church has abandoned this, really, by and large, they've abandoned this. And it's become very feeling, sensation-oriented. They emphasize the God within. And um, they talk about being passive in the hands of the Spirit. You read the Deeper Lifers, you'll see that phrase a lot. The problem with passivity is dangerous. You know, when you're watching a, a video, you know what you're doing? You're, you're passive. Okay, you're, just, you're sort of zoned out. You're just passivity. Buddhism, meditation, they, they create, they, you must have a passive state. Famous book called War on the Saints by Jesse Penn Lewis. And um, it was written in the aftermath of the Welsh Revival. And they talk about demonic activity. And I understand we want to be about the Lord, not about that. Man, I understand that. But there was all sorts of demonic activity that erupted in the midst of the Welsh Revival and after the Welsh Revival. Because God's doing a great work and Satan is in a rage. And he starts creating all sorts of weird spiritual stuff that was just over the top. And one of the themes of their book is because they were, they were very much on the deeper life level. And they said, you must beware of that whole thing of being passive. Because a passive state gives entrance to devils. Some of the modern churches, they practice contemplative prayer. And, and it's just, you sit there. And boy, soon, I read it. I've read the, uh, some of the Buddhist stuff. And, and it's all about, you sit there and, and you're, you're, you, you clear your mind. You empty your mind. And that, that's Buddhism. And, and that's the beginning of some of those nirvana states and all that. And um, I'm reading this contemplative prayer. And you go and you, you don't say a word. 
you just clear your mind and I'm going ding, 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 ding. A passive state opens your mind to devils. So I got to close. I got a couple minutes. Psalm 91. Psalm 91. The deeper life. Let's put it where you can get a hold of it. You know what we all are? We're all a work in progress. We have not attained. I, I read the other day, Paul said it. Paul said, I have not attained. Man, I like that. It encourages me. Psalm 91, 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. Man, your secret life with the Lord is the heartbeat of your Christian life. He that dwelleth, 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 stay in there, dwelleth in the secret place, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Um, stay in the book and stay on your knees. Boy, you've heard that a lot, isn't it? In through the years. Um, an old poem of long ago, I'm just a poor sinner and nothing at all, but Jesus Christ is my all in all. You know what Spurgeon said long ago? He said, if you grow till you are less than nothing, you are full grown. But he said, but alas, how few have reached that stage. <laughs> if you grow till you're less than nothing. Kurt Bork, heard him say it often. Colossians 3.11. He'd get on a, on a rant and he'd finally go, Christ is all. Christ is all. You know, you say, you know what Paul said? For me to live is Christ. Here's the thought. It's more and more. It's more and more. George Mueller, he said, it all started simple. That he, said, he said, I just started real small. He said, I tell everybody, you can't start with where I'm at. He said, we all start at the same place. And he says, it's really simple. All the simplicity that's in Christ, you start where you're at. And it's more and more, more and more. Lord, work in me. Lord, I got a problem here. And Lord, I've tried to fix it. Here's a deeper life. Lord, I can't fix it. I, I, I had a problem. I couldn't. I said, oh, God, I can't fix this. I'm trying. Lord, you got to do something in my heart. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And he did it. And he did it. Guess who gets the credit? He does. More and more. You depend on Jesus Christ. And then, you know what you wind up doing? You wind up praising him lots. Praising him lots. You know what I saw in Kurt Bork? Good grief. He just vibrated with the joy of the Lord. And, um, and I, I've thought a lot about a verse I see in Psalm 115. You say, preacher, you say, well, I don't know about all this rejoicing stuff. Listen to me. Psalm 1611. In thy presence is fullness of joy. You're going to be in heaven someday. You know what? <laughs> I hate to disappoint you. And you, you may be very calm, cool, and collected. But in heaven, you're not going to go, wow, this is wonderful. Read what's going on in Revelation. There's thunders. There's lightnings. It is the most sensational place on the universe. And you keep seeing the word in Revelation loud, 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 loud. You know why? It's not because God puts a heap of estimate on volume. But it's because people are excited off the chart and finally they can be excited and lose all their inhibitions and just rejoice in Christ Jesus. Psalm 115, it says, The dead praise not the Lord. The deeper life, it's just about more and more and more and more. Just loving him, trusting him, letting him work, and being in the secret place. Amen.